John Fuang once received a letter from a Dharma practitioner in Singapore who talked about his practice of Dharma in daily life, how whatever he was doing at work, at home, even watching TV, he just tried to notice how everything was impermanent, suffering, not self. And John Fung told me to write back to the guy and say, the problem is not with the TV or your work or home. The problem is inside the mind. Don't go criticizing the world out there. Start looking at what's wrong with your own mind. That's an important point. The problem is what the mind is doing. It's not with things outside. There's an emphasis that's developed over the centuries in different branches of Buddhism to focus on how things are empty or things are marked by the three characteristics. And the problem is that we want them to be permanent, but they're not. We want them to have substance, but they're not. Well, permanence and substance may be issues sometimes, but they're not the only issues. The mind has lots of other issues, but things outside. And often we're attached to things not because we think they're permanent or they have a substance, but simply because we think that the pleasure we get out of them is worth the effort that goes into getting it. And people get married realizing that the marriage is not going to last forever. All kinds of things that people hold on to in full knowledge that they're not going to last forever. And yet they still hold on, and they still suffer. It's in the way they hold on. That's the problem. The motivation to hold on, the motivation to create experiences that they will then hold on to is what the real problem is. We're not simply passive observers of the world around us. We're out there actively creating large parts of it, or states of becoming come from within. So we have to turn around and look at this problem inside. What is your mind doing? No matter what the problem is, the problem that makes the mind suffer is something the mind is doing. This is why in the practice of mindfulness, alertness means just that. You're in the present moment, not watching just whatever comes up in the present moment, but specifically what you're doing and the results of what you're doing. As John Lee once said, if you see causes without effects, it's not discernment. If you see effects without causes, it's not discernment. You have to see the connections. So you have to be alert to these things. So whatever the problem is that you're going to encounter in your meditation, whether it's distraction or pain, the problem is not so much the pain or the distraction. It's why the mind wants to get involved the way it is involved with it. And then trying to figure out how to disinvolve it, get it unconnected from that, take apart the way it perceives the things, relates to the things. And that's when you can let go. For instance, when you're going to deal with pain, it's not simply a matter of noting that the pain is there. You have to ask questions about it, and the questions have to do with what are you doing. Of course, with the pain, what you're doing is the perception, the way you're paying attention, and the stories you bring to it, and all the other issues around the pain that you add to the pain. And often there are things that we've been doing so often that we don't notice them. We think that they're part of the pain. But part of the way the mind has to react to the pain. It doesn't have to react in those ways. It doesn't have to perceive the pain the way it does. And John Mahabhu has a lot of good ways of questioning your relationship to the pain, questioning your understanding of the pain, your perception of the pain. Perception seems to be the big issue for a lot of the forest of Johns.
in dealing with pain. Perception is the issue in dealing with the issue of the unattractiveness of the body. Why is it that you can be focused on the unattractiveness of the body for an hour or so and then suddenly switch and all of a sudden the body's attractive again? What happened? The body didn't change. It was your perception. The same with the pain. Sometimes you come to the pain with a lot of stories around why it's not fair that that pain is there, and or maybe feeling bad about yourself. Maybe this pain is punishment for something. All kinds of weird things the mind can carry on, even if it's just basic noting the pain, the fact that it's there. What image do you have in mind? What perception are you carrying? that you've slapped onto the pain, which you are then looking at rather than looking at the actual pain. Is the pain solid? Is it taking over the, that part of your body? Is it the same thing as that part of the body? Is it lodged in your mind? Then look to see if you can see that none of those perceptions are true. And try other perceptions. The perception of the pain is just points. Or that it's a different level of energy from the body. It seems to be in the same place, but just like radio waves from different stations can be in the same place. They carry different messages. They're on a different frequency. The pain is a different frequency from the body. Can you see that? Or can you perceive the pain as going away from you? These little moments of pain as they arise. They arise and they go away. They arise and they go away. They're not coming at you. These questions may sound a little strange, but the mind has a lot of strange attitudes around pain. That's why it holds on to it. Even though it doesn't like it, it's still holding on. It developed a range of perceptions that it felt would keep pains under control. But many times those perceptions can then get in the way. And a lot of those perceptions come from a time when you hadn't learned a language yet, so they're preferable. And they can be very strange. So you have to ask strange questions in order to dig them out. So when you're sitting with pain, dealing with pain, it's not simply a matter of going in and bearing with it. It's asking yourself, how am I relating to this? This is where alertness comes in, in the mindfulness practice, and where your evaluation comes in and as mindfulness sh shades into right concentration, evaluating what you're doing, the results you're getting, making that your major, major focus, remembering that we're not just passive observers watching things that are just going on their own. They have their way of going on their own, but we have our way of getting meddling with them. And if we didn't meddle with them, we wouldn't be aware of them at all. So it's our meddling that makes us aware of these things to begin with. As the Buddha said, all dhammas are rooted in desire. This doesn't mean that the world out there is caused by your desire, but your experience of the world is very strongly shaped by your desires. And it's your choice to. What kind of desires do you want to go with? The desires that continue to create suffering or the desires that become part of the path? So as we have the problem of suffering, we're not innocent. We're implicated. And it's simply a matter of learning how to accept that fact and have respect for that fact. When the Buddha learned the path to awakening, it wasn't necessarily the path that he thought he wanted. And to reveal things about himself he didn't necessarily want to see. But when the truth came up that he was implicated in this, he was responsible for a lot of this, he learned how to respect that fact. He didn't try to deny it, he didn't try to run away from it or turn it into something else. The suttas tell us that after his awakening, he asked himself, who should he respect? <clears throat> who should he hold in respect? He didn't see any human being or any Dave or anybody. That's what he could hold 
as an object of respect. But he said, well, there's the Dharma. And the Dharma here doesn't mean the words that he taught, but it was the truth that he found. That's because he's willing to respect it to begin with. That's why he found it. And when the Dharma is a mirror, as he often says, and it's showing you this is what your mind is doing wrong. You want to learn how to respect that. Because the problem is precisely where we'd rather not look, or rather we would not assign blame. Well, it's not so much a matter of blame, it's simply responsibility. Until we stop resisting that, we're not going to see anything. So what are you doing? That's a question you should be asking yourself all the time. And do you like the results? And learn to have very high standards as to what you're going to like and not like. That's how these questions can take you far.